Welcome to the 3C Live Experience, a dynamic, multiracial, fast-growing church with thousands of believers filled with passion for God and for people. Let's join 3C in this live experience. Family, we're going to get into the Word, and if you're not already seated, please just take your seats and uh, get out your Bibles, your pens, your notebooks, and uh, we're going to get into God's Word. And I know that God is going to challenge us, and change is forthcoming because that's what God's Word does. And it's going to challenge you, it's going to challenge me, take us to that new level, uh, that which God has got in store for us. Now, we looked at the Word last week, and uh, we spoke about speaking the Word with purpose, speak with purpose purpose. Speak the word with intent. And we continue along those lines and we're looking at part two. And uh, at speak with purpose, the hashtag is speak with purpose. And uh, 2 Corinthians 4 and uh, verse 13, it says, I believed and therefore I spoke. We believe and therefore we speak. And God has called us to speak from a place of faith. It's so important that we speak with intent because what you speak will come to fruition. Uh, what you speak is multiplied. And the Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. You have the right to choose. You can speak death or you can speak life. I'm not talking about speaking positively because you can speak positively and it still be death. It is the word of God that brings forth life. And therefore, when we say speaking, we're saying we believed and therefore we speak. We believe and therefore we speak. Believe in what? Well, verse 14 says, believing in Jesus. The fact that the Father uh, has raised him up. And because the Father raised him up, he also raises us up and presents us together with him. And therefore, because of the work of the power of the cross of Calvary within our lives, the faith in what Jesus did for us, therefore we can speak. Why? Because we believe in Jesus. We believe that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We believe that we have been forgiven of all our sin. We believe that we have been cleansed now and continually. We believe that we have been justified and God sees us as though we've never sinned. We believe that we are sanctified, set apart for God's purpose. And therefore, we need to speak with intent, speak on purpose. We get up on purpose, we walk on purpose, we live life on purpose, we speak with purpose. So we believe, and then uh, like what the uh, verse 15 says of, of Corinthians, it says, and all things are for your sakes, all things are for your benefit. You see, God has purposed us to live for him so that he might receive glory in everything that we do. And that's what the verse 15 says. He says, all of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, in other words, as you speak with more purpose, you speak with more intent, more lives are touched. He says, and when there's more lives touched, there's more thanksgiving. He says, and God will receive more and more glory. How does God receive the glory? God receives the glory when through each and every one of us, his character is portrayed. When people look at you, they see the magnificence of God. They see the, 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 the awesomeness of who God is, the love of God, the grace of God, and the mercy of God. And therefore, irrespective of the situation we're going through, and you can choose. You can choose to speak the circumstances. You can choose to speak the fact. Um, you can choose to speak failure. You can choose to speak discouragement. Uh, you can choose to gossip and uh, put other people down so that you can feel good about yourself or you can speak the word. We are hard pressed with troubles on, on every side. He says, yet we not crushed. So we don't speak the troubles. We don't glory in the troubles. But you know what? We're not crushed. He says, we are perplexed. In other words, there's uncertainty in our future. He says, but we're not in despair. He says, we, we are a Persecuted. In other words, there's organized, systematic, continual harassment taking place against us and against our lives. He says, but we're not forsaken. In other words, we're not left uncared for. God is with us. We struck down. In other words, we've gone through stuff. We felt the blows of life. Might it be through health? Might it be through, through uh, the loss of a loved one? Might it be through violence that you've experienced? Whatever it might be. He says, you've experienced that pain and you've been knocked down. You've received that blow. He says, but you're not destroyed. You're not counted out. Why? Because God is with you. And therefore, you can decide 
You can decide what you speak. You can, you can decide. You're going to speak the circumstances. You're going to speak the fact. Or you're going to speak the word of God. And that's why it's so important. We need to speak with intent. Speak with purpose. Forging the future. Making sure that we speak the future for the benefit of others. Verse 15 of 2 Corinthians 4. For the benefit of others. In other words, we don't live for ourselves. And that's why James chapter 1 and verse 22, he says the following. He says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're just fooling yourself. You see, this is what Christianity is about. This is what uh, 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 being spiritual is about. Is that we don't just listen to the word of God, but we obey the word of God. Verse 25 of James chapter 1 says, But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard. Remember the word of God. He says, then God will bless you for doing the word. In other words, God will bless you as you apply, as you speak it into existence, as you understand who you are. What happens now is you start speaking accordingly and as you speak it, you speak it into existence. But the problem is, verse 26, he says, but uh, you claim to be spiritual. You claim to be religious. I'm going to church. I'm paying my tithes. I'm singing everybody. Look, he says, but uh, you can't control your tongue. He says, and if you claim to be religious and don't control your tongue, the Bible says you're fooling yourself. What, what type of spirituality is that? Your religion is worthless. You talk, you're Christian. Your Christianity is useless. If you talk about you so spiritual, but you can't control your tongue. In other words, you, you're speaking doom and you're speaking failure and you, 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 you're speaking discouragement uh, in your life because that's what you're going to get. And it's not just in your life. You're talking, you're speaking suspicion, suspicion of, suspicious of everybody. See, you can't, you can't not have faith. We've got to have faith in God. Having faith in God means you have faith in people. You see, because you trust God, you can trust people. We're all fallible. We all make mistakes. But you see, the same God that's working in my life is the same God that's working in my wife's life, is the same God that's working in my children's life, is the same God that's working in your lives, is the same God that's working in every person's life that is now sitting in prison. It's the same God working in their lives. You think God's word can't change and transform people's life? Where's the faith? He says, I believed and therefore I spoke. So we can't just speak judgment on people. We can't just uh, 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 take people's failures and uh, identify them according to their failures. No, he says pure and genuine religion in the sight of God is what? It means you care for the orphans. In other words, you've got a spirit of a father. You've got a spirit of a mother. This is not just physical orphans. This is spiritual orphans. What's the issue we have in our nation today? Is fatherlessness, motherlessness. That's the issue. Whether it's in the uh, squatter camps where we are very, very active. We see in the street the fatherlessness, the motherlessness. But let me tell you, even in the wealthiest of places, there are children that do what they want. They don't have parents that are leading them they, uh, in the fear of God. So we have a fatherless generation. We have a motherless generation. And God has called us to take care of the orphans. Not just to look after your own children, but to look after the, the, the neighborhood's children. It takes a village to raise a child. So together we have a spirit of a, of, a, of a father that even when your kids make mistakes, you still love them. You still want to help them. You still care for them. You give them another a chance. You, you forgive them and say, right, let's, let's work on this together. See, we need that spirit. That's pure and genuine religion. That's spirituality. That's what it means to be a Christian. So my question is, where's, where's the orphans you're caring for? Where's, the, where's, where's your disciples? Where, where, where is the responsibility that you're taking, not just for your own family and just me and my little own and protect what I have? Where is the heart that you have? And you say that you're a Christian, that God dwells within you, the big God that has the capacity to love the whole world. Don't you think he can give you the same capacity that you can love more? And give of yourself even more. You see, the, the less you focus on yourself, 
That's why it says, in, it says being obsessed with yourself, obsession with self. The less you obsessed with yourself, but you're given over to God, see, the more God grows your capacity. And that's why we, we, we also mentioned, you. that's why we go through tests and trials. Why? That God can increase your capacity to love more. Embrace it and say, thank you, Lord. I'm growing, I'm learning. It's the pressure that grows you. So true spirituality is not about just singing Kumbaya, my Lord. Sing, I love you, Lord. Show the love. Where's the action? What are you doing? Don't say, I love you, Lord. Let's see how you love the Lord. And that's why here at the 3C family, you've got to understand, we love people. We love people, whether they like you or not, that's irrelevant. We're not here to get everybody to like you. You're not trying to get your children to like you all the time, although it helps, right? No, we love our children, irrespective of whether they agree with you or not. We show our love. And that's why the Bible says true religion means you care for the orphans and the widows. In other words, those that have lost a team member, those that have lost a pillar within their life. There are people that don't have that pillar anymore. We are called to help them. And then the Bible says, and also refusing to let the world corrupt you. How, do, how does the world corrupt you? Through fear. The temptation not to trust the Lord. The temptation to do things out of your own strength. The temptation to depend upon yourself. You see, that's the world corrupting you. No, we put our faith and our trust in the Lord. And I wanna take it a bit further today as we go into today's message because, because it's, it's so important that we understand that we need to speak with intent because you create the world by your words. That's why in the Bible in Genesis 1, he said, let there be light and there was light. And, 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 and it came into existence, Genesis chapter 1. I believed and therefore I spoke. We believed and therefore we speak. What do you believe? Because according to what you see is what you believe. According to what you believe is what you speak. And according to what you speak is what you're going to get in your own life, your family's life and those beyond you. And we see the issue with, with, with uh, uh, Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. You've seen it so many times. You see, as their eyes were opened, the Bible says in Genesis 3, verse 7, he says, they knew that they were naked. And what did they do? They sewed some fig leaves and they covered themselves. They made themselves covering because they realized when they sinned before God, uh, they were suddenly conscious of themselves. Instead of being God conscious, before they sinned, they were God conscious. Everything was about God. But you see, once they sinned, there was a self-consciousness. And I've realized that sin causes you to be consumed with self. And you, it brings into your life an identity crisis. Who are you? Because according to how you see yourself is how you're going to speak. I'll say that again. According to how you see yourself, the image that you have of who you are, according to your identity is how you're going to speak and how you speak is, is, is what you're going to become. And with Adam and Eve, they became self-conscious. Where they were God-conscious, they suddenly became self-conscious and had to start working on that image. And that's why they had those, those fig leaves. But God came and he got rid of those fig leaves. He then clothed them, um, we read in the Bible, and he clothed them with, with animal skins. And he said, you can't clothe yourself. Let me, let me be your image. Now, now we're gonna take some time and we're gonna speak on that today. Because sin causes you to be consumed with you and yourself and we're gonna look at the question, who are you? Who are you? What determines your identity? And I want us to look at a guy called Moses. We all know about Moses, right? Exodus chapter three, we see that Moses has an identity crisis. Now, you must know that he was uh, born Jewish, but he was raised Egyptian. So he's born Jewish, raised Egyptian, raised, now, now being in Egypt is a type of the world. The Jewish is a type of the godly nation. His identity was as a Jewish boy, but he grew up in the world. And we see that as he grew older, he had an identity crisis. And this was manifested when he was uh, uh, busy uh, driving around uh, on his horse, Ferrari horse. I don't know what it was, but anyway, and he saw a Jewish man and he saw an Egyptian and this Egyptian was beating the Jewish man. And what did he do? 
he tried to protect uh, the man and in so doing, he killed the Egyptian. Now, obviously, he had to now run away because what did he do? He tried to fix a spiritual problem in a natural way. So we see that Moses runs away and uh, he goes out and he becomes a shepherd boy, you know, in the, in the mountains. And uh, then in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 13, so with that background, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 13, we see that Moses has a burning bush experience. And we see he comes to that place where, where um, he gets challenged. In verse 10 of Exodus chapter 3, he says, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you might bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now, here's a command from God for him to deliver a nation from the enslavement of Egypt at that, at that time. But we see Moses is still struggling with identity. And we see in verse 11 says, but Moses said to God, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And maybe you're struggling with that situation within your life at the moment. Who am I? Where do I fit in? You see, because everybody is telling you who you are. Everybody is shouting from all over the place who you are and who you should be. And Moses is in this place and says to God, he says, who am I? And we see that there's a struggle with identity. Let me tell you why. Because from the start, the devil knows that if he can mess with your identity, he can mess with your destiny. Because your identity determines your destiny. Knowing who you are determines what you see. According to what you see is what you speak. According to what you speak will happen. You see, so here is Moses. The devil is messing with his identity. And at this age of his life, he doesn't know. I mean, the, the guy is in his 40s or 50s at that stage. And he's asking, who am I? Who am I? And maybe you asking that question in your workplace, wherever you are. Who am I? He says that I should bring the children out of Egypt. Now, I want to show you this. This is actually quite interesting how God answers. And he says, to Moses. He says to Moses, Moses, I will certainly be with you. I will certainly be with you. And then he goes on and says, you know, and, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. What does Moses say? Moses says, mm, yeah, indeed. He says, sure, but actually that doesn't help me because Moses is saying, who am I? What does God say? He says, I will certainly be with you. Moses is going, hang on. That's not what I'm asking. I'm not asking if you're going to be with me. God answers. He says, I will be with you. Moses is saying, he says, indeed, I understand. He says, when I come to the children of Israel, he says, here's the problem. I need to be able to tell them who sent me. What is his name? I need a name. I need to name drop. You see, we, we're good at name dropping, right? We're big on name dropping. He's saying, hang on. He says to the Lord, look, I appreciate that you're going to be with me. He says, but you know, I need a name. I need a name. What shall I say to them? What is his name? What shall I say to them? I need a name. So what does God say in verse 14? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Come again. I am who I am. When Moses asked, who am I? Uh, God says, I will certainly be with you. Because in actual fact, who you are, it, it doesn't really figure into the situation. It's who God is that really matters. And that's why when people say, you know, well, who am I? Well, I am who you say I am. I am because God is I am. And therefore, if you are who I am, and in God we are one, and we are his child, then when God says, I am who I am, and people come to you and say, well, who sent you? What name are you doing? What do you say? I am has sent me. 
Your identity is in who he is, not in who you are. And that when God sends you and places a mandate on your life, you are sent with the full authority of the Father, of the power of God that is backing you. And all you have to say is, I am sent me. Many of us, I, I ask people, who are you? They say, well, I'm a teacher. I'm not asking what you do. I'm asking who are you? I don't ask you what work you do. See, people find their identity within their work. Well, who are you? Well, I'm ANC, I am EFF, I am DA. I didn't ask what political party you belong to. I asked, who are you? Well, I am Zulu, I am Afrikaner, uh, I am Susutu. Uh, I'm not asking what nationality, I'm not asking your tribal identity. I'm asking, who are you? See, many people don't know who they are. And therefore, they're trying to find their identity. Many find their identity in stuff. And whatever you find your identity is in what you flaunt and what you, what you, 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 you know, what you uh, speak and what you tell everybody. Some people don't find their identity in work, but they'll find it in a hobby, in a hobby. So listen to what people speak about according to what they refer themselves to and their identity is, is who they are. And therefore, you have people that identify themselves, you know, it's not in their work, but maybe it's in their hobby. So they'll always speak about golf, golf, golf. And you can try to go to any other subject. They'll always bring it back to golf. Why? That's where they find their identity. That's where their life is. So my question is, where is your identity? Your identity can't be in stuff. And many people are, their identity is in stuff. And like I've said long ago, it could be in your car. You get in your car and you, your, your, your top is down and you're driving around in your car with your sunglasses on at night. Where's your identity? In your car. You've even got a big thing with your car's emblem on your key to show everybody what you drive. Identity in your car. Some people's identity is in their home, where they stay, what suburb they stay. Some people's identities in their education, well, my name is not John, it's Dr. John, and then giving the, all the letters of the alphabet. And look, I don't have an issue with titles, that's not the issue, but when your identity is in your education, I don't have an issue with having uh, skill and being educated, but your identity is not in your education. Your identity is not in your skin color. Your identity is not in, in you know, uh, what country you belong to. And that's why he says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28, he said, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. He says, there is neither male nor female, for we are all one in Christ. Where is our identity? Our identity is in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's given us a new identity. You see, our identity we find in the word, God's plan for our life. Identity is not found in race, Jew or Greek, or slave or free. In other words, whether you got money or whether you don't have money, um, or slave or free, uh, whether you're an employee or an employer, uh, whether you own or how much money you have, there's no identity in your rank as far as your finances are concerned. He says, in actual fact, there's not even a rank as far as male and female is concerned. That's what the Bible says. Bible says that neither male nor female, he says, you are all one in Christ Jesus. We're all one. You know, look at Luke chapter one and verse 36. We talk about uh, Elizabeth. She conceived a son in her old age, but this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. You see, that's what we tend to do. We call people by their failures. Elizabeth, they called her barren Elizabeth. She was known... And that's Elizabeth. Which, which Elizabeth are you talking about? No, the barren one. Oh, okay. No, we know exactly who you are talking about. You see, and what is God doing? He refutes that. And Elizabeth, she, she decided that she will not be called by her failures. But rather she took the word of God. And you know what happened? She was able to bear a child. We look at Genesis chapter 17 and verse 4. 
He says to Abraham, no longer shall you be called Abraham, but Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. See, they decided once again, they went around and said, right, no more Abraham. Now we call you Abraham. And every, what does Abraham mean? Abraham means father of many nations. Father of many nations. Decided not to be called by the failure or the weakness, but rather to speak the word. Speak the word. And every time Sarah would say, Abraham, father of many nations. And then everybody looks, they see this old man and old woman walking around past their childbearing years. What did they do? They spoke the word of God. And verse 15, it speaks about Sarah as well. Her name shall no longer be Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name and I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. So even change Sarah's name and, 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 and it, she received the rightful calling of God upon her life. Not, not, not saying, okay, Sarah, you the husband of Abraham. No, Sarah, the mother of nations, the mother of nations. I want to know every woman Every woman listening to the sermon, God has placed a calling upon your life. And yes, even though you and your husband are there to work together as a team, uh, because uh, two is always better than one, but know that you are called by God. You are called by God. There's an identity placed upon you, a mother of nations, mother of nations. You're called to be a world changer and a history maker. But what do we do? We tend to call people by their failures. Don't we do that? Oh, you know that guy? Which guy are you talking about? You know that druggy guy? Oh, yes, yes, I know that druggy guy. We don't know his name, but we know he's the druggy guy. And what about that woman? Which woman is that? Oh, you know that, that, that one, she's pregnant again, man. And she, it's now her third, her third child, three different guys. You, 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 oh, yes, I know who that one is. You know, uh, she's, the, she's, the pregnant, she's the pregnant one. Don't know her name, but we call them by their failures. And that other guy, that guy that went to prison, you know, he was, you know, he was a judge and everything. Went, oh, yes, I know exactly who. Yes, the, yeah, the, 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 prison, the, the, the prison judge. Yes, yes, you know, we know about that guy. And that guy who lost his house, remember, he was always thought, you know, he was so wealthy. I always asked, yeah, I'm not sure where he got his wealth from. Yeah, remember, yeah, yeah, that guy who lost everything. What's his name? No, I don't know what his name. That guy that went bankrupt, that took his milk and everything. You see, that's what we do. We call people by their failures. We call people by their failures. We know them by their failures. And that girl, the one with the short dress, oh, yes. And that guy, the guy that, that doesn't have shoes, yes. You see, we call people by their failures. But thank God he doesn't call us by our failures. Thank God that he calls us according to the destiny that he has placed upon his, our lives. No matter what label the world is putting on you, no matter what label Twitter is putting on you, no matter what label your friends at school are putting on you, no matter the label, you see at the end of the day, you are called by God. Your identity is in God. And that's why 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All the old things have passed away. He says, and all things have become new. Isn't that incredible? In other words, you've moved from identity to destiny. We have a new identity in Jesus and in this new identity, it determines the destiny and that destiny is in Jesus Christ. And now according to how you see yourself is according to how we speak. According to how God sees you is how you see yourself covered by the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have been redeemed. You have been forgiven. You have been cleansed, justified and sanctified, set apart for God's purpose. What do you speak? You don't speak your failures. You don't speak your insecurities. You don't speak the fact. You don't speak the, 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 the reality. What do you do? You speak the future into existence. You speak the Word of God and prophesy and proclaim the Word of God and start seeing yourself the way that God sees you. Start seeing yourself the way that God sees you. And don't let any people bring you down in your identity that you relegate who you are to something in the physical, to the pigmentation of our skin. Seriously, to what language you speak, to how much money you have in the bank, to what car you drive, to where you live and where you stay, to how much you possess. 
according to how little or how much education you have. Don't allow anybody to label you according to the flesh. Understand who you are in God. And by that, I'm not saying we can't celebrate who we are. Um, By that, I'm not saying we can't celebrate um, where we come from. By that, I'm not saying that we can't celebrate our family and our past. I'm not saying that. But you see, that's not your identity. Your identity is in the one who created you, the one who made you. And let me tell you, you are called by God. No one can define you or can label you. And I don't care who it is. I don't care who it is. I don't care uh, how much money they have. I don't care what position they have. Who you are is determined by your destiny that you have in God. Therefore, Let's look at what that is. And I start closing off with this. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 18. It says, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and has given us what? The ministry of reconciliation. Now that we're in Christ, what, 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 is, our, what, is, what is the way we serve? To, a ministry means a way of serving. So we minister what? Reconciliation. So everybody has received the ministry of reconciliation in verse 19 and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And, and verse, verse uh, uh, 20 says that we are now ambassadors of Christ where God is appealing through us, come back to God, be reconciled to God. That is the business of God getting everybody that doesn't know God to be reconciled to God. Why? So that they can live a free life. So they can live a life of destiny. So that they can become everything that God has destined them to be. And everything that God has placed on the inside of them that may come through to the form. So as I was saying, I'm closing off and I, I want to close off. I want to close off with this. You see, Jesus was tempted in his identity. And I want you to see that every single day you'll be tested. That's the one thing you'll see. The biggest issues that we have, everything on Twitter, you'll see 99% of the things you find on social media that you find in the news is around identity, who I am, uh, how I see myself. And we see that in Matthew 3 verse 17, that uh, when Jesus was baptised, We see that there was an earthquake and the father said the following. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my beloved son. Now, now if I was the father introducing Jesus, see, I would have said it differently. I would have said the following. I would have said, this is my beloved son, Jesus. I would have pushed his name. I would have pushed who he is. And I would push what he had accomplished and what he's going to do. But this is not what the father said. I would have said, this dude is going to heal the sick and he's going to cleanse the lepers. He's going to raise the dead. And I would, I would, let me tell you, I would have a resume for Jesus, four pages of resume for Jesus. That's how I would have identified Jesus. But we see the father doesn't do that. He says, this is my beloved son who I am well pleased. And then he says to Jesus, okay, now go do the work. That's it. You're my beloved son. This is who you are. I like you. (laughs) Um, I'm pleased because you're my son. There you go. Bye-bye. That's it. Settled. Identity. Finished. That's it. That's it. This is my beloved son. Not what are you going to do? This is what you're going to achieve. You see, because that's what we do. We, we identify people according to their works and, and their achievements. No, the father identifies according to relationship. He says, my beloved son, I am well pleased. And that's what God's saying to you today. He says, you are my child. You're my son. You're my daughter. I love you. Uh, I like you. Now, I, I, I'm well pleased. Now, Go do the job. Off you go. I've placed you on the earth. There's purpose for your life. I love you. You're my daughter. You're my son. Now get on with the business. You see, it's, it's, it's as simple as that. You see, there's confusion when there's fear. There's confusion when there's disobedience. 
With confusion comes chaos. And this confusion and chaos comes from fear and a lack of identity. And that's where the devil will always attack you. Who you are, am I good enough? You know, am I going to make it? Who am I? That lack of identity, that's confusion. That's because you don't have a relationship with God. There's no confusion when it comes to God. Absolutely zero confusion. He says, you're my son, you're my daughter. Now, this is your mandate. This is your calling. Now get on with the job. Get on with the job. It's as easy as that. You see, so, so when, when, uh, when you settle the identity issue, destiny automatically flows. When you se- settle identity, destiny just naturally flows. But now here's the issue. Matthew 3, 17, God says, he says, this is my beloved son. I'm well pleased. Now, Jesus, off you go, do the job. The next chapter, go from Matthew 3 to Matthew 4, the very next chapter, we see that the devil attacks his identity. In chapter 3, the father says, this is my beloved son. And then we see in Matthew chapter 4 and, 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 and verse 3, the devil comes to Jesus and says, if you are the son of God, if. He immediately challenges the identity of Jesus. Immediately, immediately starts off and challenges the identity of Jesus. Why? Because if he messes with Jesus' identity, he messes with the destiny of Jesus and what God wants to do in and through him. But what do we see in temptation number one, verse three? He says, Jesus, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, he says, command these stones to become bread. But he answered it and he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What did Jesus do? Immediately, he linked his identity to God. Immediately, immediately. If you are the son of God, He said to the devil, I am the son of God. And you know what? I am not going to speak. So Jesus is tempted to take stones and make it bread. And I'm sure he could have done that. He was tempted to operate within the natural. But he said, no, it's only the word that proceeds from the mouth of God that I speak. Speaking with purpose. Speaking with intent. Are you hearing me here today? That's why we call to speak with purpose. We call to speak with intent. Jesus says, no word, I speak. And it's based on my relationship with the Father. Now we see he gets tempted again. Temptation number two. The devil says, if you are the son of God, he says, he says, throw yourself down. He says, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. So what does Jesus say to him in verse seven? He says, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Watch once again, Jesus links himself to his identity in the Father. Immediately, his response is linked in his identity. He doesn't answer uh, in a natural way. He doesn't even think in a natural way. He immediately connects his identity to the Father. And so he overcomes that temptation. So it's twice. It's twice he's tempted in his identity. And then we see the third time in verse 8. The devil comes to him and says, look, all these things, all these things I give you. If you fall down and worship me. And then verse 10, then Jesus says to him, what does he say? He says, hey, away with me, Satan. I'm done with this. For it is written. What does it say? Once again, watch this. Linking to identity. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. You see, your confidence doesn't come from the praise of man. Someone patting you on the back and saying, hey, you're awesome. You did a great job. You see, your confidence comes when, when, when something rises up on the inside of you. Why? Because you know who you are. I don't need someone to say thank you. I don't need someone to put a, you know, a slap on the back and say, hey, well done, you're awesome, you're awesome. You know, if it wasn't for you, I don't need that within my life. And by that, I'm not saying we mustn't be rude and not acknowledge people. That's not what I'm saying. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that we don't need that within our life. Why? Because we know who we are. We are ambassadors for Christ. God is appealing through us. He's saying, come back to God. God is using us to to take people and 
reconcile them to the Lord as fathers and mothers of nations. And now according to that, what do we do? We speak the future. We speak with intent. We speak with purpose. And therefore I want to encourage you today that Jesus lost his identity so that your identity can be restored. As many were amazed when they saw him because his face was so disfigured that he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know that he was a man. Jesus lost his identity that they could not recognize him as, as a man. In Isaiah 50 verse six, it says, I gave, it says, my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. Jesus lost his identity. The blood flowed from his face and he lost his identity so that our identity can be restored. And therefore I wanna encourage you, where you have become self-conscious, being sensitive of what everybody says, conscious about who you are rather than a God conscious through the identity that you have in Jesus, you're moving away from that self-consciousness to a God consciousness. From the sensitivity that you have to the opinions of others, trying to make everybody happy, rather to a sensitivity of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit leading you and guiding you all things. From the fear of man, fear of people, to a fear of God. From rejection that you've experienced to acceptance in God. From the place of shame to a place of confidence a place of inadequacy to being complete in God, from a place of insecurity to a place of security and confidence in God. And from that low self-esteem, <laughs> through the blood of Jesus Christ, you have a healthy esteem in Christ. You know who you are. And therefore I want you to know today, you are the answer. You know who you are. And God says, I equip you for every good thing for doing my will. And I will place within you my desire that causes you to do everything that pleases me. And through the blood of Jesus, there will be a confidence as you come into my presence to speak the word of God, to be a father and mother of nations through the blood of Jesus as you experience my redemption, my forgiveness, you're experiencing my, uh, my, 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 my power. God says, this fire is birthed on the inside of you. You are a father of nations. You are a mother of nations. Don't settle for second best. 3C Church presents our first It's a Girl Thing virtual women's conference forever. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. On what were its footings set or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. Have you ever journeyed into the springs of the sea? or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail? Does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? God, creator, savior, God, with us, for us, God, forever and ever with your host, Pastor Shane Pretorius. Forever Virtual Women's Conference, 14 to 16 October, 2020. This 3C Live experience was brought to you by the 3C Media Production. For more information, call us on 86 or log on to my3c.tv.